Welcome, everyone. This is your host, Adam Coleman. With me today, we have Kristen Carmichael. She's both a divorce mediator and a financial coach and is a certified divorce financial analyst. Kristen, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Well, before we begin, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're the founder of two different companies ranging from divorce mediation and financial coaching. So maybe speak about those and what made you go into divorce planning? Absolutely. So my background is as a licensed Arizona attorney, and I'm also a mediator and certified divorce financial analyst. So I started mediation in law school, just absolutely fell in love with helping families keep their process outside of court, keep their conflict low, be able to actually personalize their agreements rather than a judge making decisions for them. And after years of mediating, I went back to get my certification as a CDFA so that I could really help people get in depth with their finances. So at this point, I run Couple Solution Center, which primarily focuses on neutral work where I am working with couples either in the capacity of divorce mediation, parenting mediation if they weren't married, or as a financial neutral. So helping them both understand their finances as they go through divorce. And then on the flip side, I have misconfidence. So confidence in your finances that primarily focuses on assisting women with understanding their finances during their divorce process. But I work with individual men as well. I just find that if I'm working with an individual, a majority of them tend to be women, just because statistically they have a lower financial education than men do in most cases. I've talked to a few different people on this episode where we, the CDFA, there's a few different versions of it. You have the people that are focused solely on the divorce planning side of things. They don't handle any kind of wealth management or really any sort of financial advice after the divorce. And then you have some that dabble in both and then just mostly wealth management side. So on yours, I know you focus a lot on the divorce during the process. What's yes. kind of the role that you take after the divorce is finalized with the financial coaching piece? Yeah. So with mine, because my background is in law rather than in finance as a base, I specifically stick within the divorce process. There's a little bit of coaching as people are exiting the divorce process, but that's primarily financial coaching in terms of understanding credit scores, how to set up a savings account, a credit card. A lot of my individual clients are those that have never handled their finances in their relationship which means they don't have their own bank account, credit card. They really haven't built any credit. They don't have any understanding of how to balance a checkbook or pay those items. So it's really going down to basics with them of how to actually handle your finances moving forward. As they transition out of the divorce process, I always refer them out to financial planners and advisors to be able to handle their planning moving forward. So essentially the difference in the role is during the divorce, I'm helping them understand what are your goals and plans for the future and how does that relate to how we can split things during your divorce process. For example, is your goal to keep your house? Does that make sense financially in terms of your budget and short-term and long-term goals? And how can we make it so that you can actually get the house? Ultimately, they'll also be working with a financial planner, a financial advisor. Ideally, some of my clients choose not to, but I really press them to because they don't have that financial knowledge or background other than the basics that we've gone through. So they then transition. And then I go over with the financial advisor. These are the things we've talked about. These are the goals. This is why the agreements are that the way that they are. We now need to manage that into the future based on what the intentions were during the divorce process. So in, in a lot of these situations, are there other attorneys involved? Are you able to handle the majority of things as the mediator, financial neutral, or do they still have their attorney involved on each side as well? It's a good question. So it totally depends on the mediator. For my cases, about 98% of my clients are pro per or pro se, essentially meaning they don't have attorneys. I strongly advise that they get legal advice and they get a list of preferred legal advisors to reference throughout their process. I would say about 50% do and 50% choose not to. Essentially, as a mediator, I can give them legal information, but I cannot provide them legal advice. And so they get information about what are the topics that we need to discuss, what typically is happening in the law, but ultimately they're making their decisions rather than me making them for them or a judge making those decisions for them. So 
even though I am an attorney, I'm never representing individuals. I'm never giving legal advice. I do handle the drafting and filing of all their legal documents. So they do have that process already handled. That's actually under a different licensure in Arizona, not super significant, but essentially I help my clients from beginning to end. Um, the biggest difference is if they are from another state. So if, for example, I'm acting as a financial neutral for clients in California, I don't handle any of their legal drafting or any of their legal process like I would for those in Arizona. This is not my area of specialty. So if I'm helping people in another state, what I do is I have a resource in that state that helps with doc drafting or an attorney that can assist with it. So they essentially work with me. I then pass that summary off so that it can actually be filed and drafted properly. So in Arizona, I handle the legal process from beginning to end for them in the mediation. In other states, if I'm acting as a financial neutral or mediator, an attorney or another professional in that state will handle their actually drafting and filing of their documents. We've hit on a few of the key members, but I guess in addition to the attorneys, in addition to the mediators, and sometimes the financial planners, what are some of the other key members that you see of that strong divorce team usually? So I am really big on collaboration. I think that everybody has a role and their thing that they specialize in. So for example, even as a CDFA, my specialty isn't in valuations of pensions or assisting with acting as an expert witness in court. It's just not my area of expertise. I primarily like to work with people on proposals, understanding the implications of their actual separation of assets, comparing things regarding taxability, really the education piece behind the finances rather than kind of that expert witness aspect of things. So I have other CDFAs that I work with for those pieces. Some other really great roles in a divorce process is someone in your role. So certified divorce lending professionals, best resource that I can have for my clients, particularly when they're thinking about keeping their home, just to get them to run the numbers. It's one of those things where when we sit down in mediation, I had a case the other day where a couple was arguing over who was going to keep the house, but we didn't have any actual numbers behind it to understand if that was even feasible. So worked with a CDLP, they actually ran all the numbers, figured out they can't keep the house. Okay. Or at least they can't in a way that's going to financially work for them. So now we're down the track of selling it or telling one spouse, yes, this is something that you can afford. The other one can't. Instead of us sitting there and arguing about things when we don't have the facts behind it, the facts are really going to help us make a decision in that meeting. So really great. I also work with a lot of realtors who are really helpful in helping people understand what does it look like if they do help sell their house? What is it going to, how are they going to work together to do that? Because a lot of people are not in the best place. They don't want to really work together that much. So having a realtor who either has a divorce designation or who understands the deep emotional impact of selling your house during a divorce, because it's going to be a very different transaction than the average person selling their house. Um, I also work with a lot of therapists Having therapists on your list is super helpful. Let that be for individuals, couples, children, divorce coaches. I work with a phenomenal divorce coach here in Arizona, Andrea Hips. She does great work helping individuals and sometimes couples really working through how do you get through the divorce and move forward from there. And it really depends on people's assets and debts. If you have a business, maybe we have a business evaluator. If you have really interesting personal property that needs to be valued. Maybe we need somebody to value that. We may need an appraisal for your home. We might need an attorney to step in to help us understand how we can build out business documents if people are going to retain a business together. So I see it as you have your own divorce team. It's completely creative and up to you what pieces we need to bring in. But as we're working through mediation or as a CDFA, I introduce those concepts as we go. So this person could be helpful to bring in this information. Oftentimes that's outside of meetings, but on occasion those people may attend meetings as well to be able to explain the information to everyone so that we're on the same page. That's really common with like a business evaluation because that's going to be much more in depth than an evaluation of any other asset or debt. 
So do you find that you're usually the first person that people reach out to if they're considering the divorce and then you're the, the ringleader to figure out the different parties involved? Yes. So as the mediator, yes. As the CDFA, no. So as a mediator attorney, you're typically going to be the first outreach person, unless you, for example, were in couples therapy and the therapist is then referring you. But generally speaking, we find in the divorce field, it's going to start with a mediator and attorney just because people just Google divorce. And so they want to figure out who's going to be kind of the hub of the wheel of spokes that you put together. And then from there, it builds from there based on what they have. Almost every state requires financial disclosures. So disclosure of assets, debts, and income at the time of divorce. Found a few that don't. Very strange to me, but to each their own. So once I have that financial disclosure, I can get a better sense of, okay, these are the assets that we're working with. These are the players that might be helpful. Ultimately, I introduce that from the beginning. Some clients are very receptive to it and they just say, yes, refer me right away. For many, it's going to be a slow process of getting them to realize that they do need that resource. And so I give my clients a list of preferred advisors that they can reference throughout the time that they're working with me in case they decide to move forward without actually, you know, talking to me about it first, totally okay. But ultimately, it's definitely pacing out when it's going to work for them. I had clients recently where from day one, we were talking about an estate plan that would be really helpful to have, and they weren't ready. Now we're a couple months in, now they realize, oh, that's going to be something that we actually need. And so we need to talk to an estate planning attorney. So sometimes it's just, I find the CDFA piece or the other pieces can sometimes be a bit harder to push because people are already very conscious of how much money they're spending on their divorce. So adding those pieces can seem like it's going to be really expensive. What I always try to highlight to people is litigation, like hiring an attorney is typically going to be 80 to 90% more expensive than going through mediation in any state that you're in. So as an example in Arizona, you know, if litigation on average is around $50,000, mediation is going to be closer to five to seven. So I always try and highlight that to people. If you're going to start mediation and your cost is going to be 80 to 90% less expensive, look how much money we have left <laughs> to be able to bring on these other resources. And it's never going to get to that place of being 50,000. You could have a few hours with an attorney. You could have a few hours with a CDFA. You could work with all these resources. Like I know the service that you offer is free when you're running all of those numbers for everyone. So they can add all those pieces on. Maybe you're going to add like another thousand dollars or two. It's not like you're going to get to the point of adding forty, forty-five thousand dollars to your process. So by being in mediation, I like to highlight it actually gives people more opportunity to have other professionals on their team because now they have more money that they can afford to give those people rather than starting right off the bat with you know fifty thousand dollars of attorneys. There's not much wiggle room left there. Well, and, and I would argue in most cases, it probably doesn't even add that much to it just because if you don't have a CDFA involved, you're still going to rely on the attorney to come up with those numbers. And they're either going to take more hours to do it and they're going to charge you a much higher hourly fee than you're trying to charge versus actually just having an expert just go ahead and do it right from the start and not have to worry about the attorney trying to figure it out on the fly. And it's like you said, I don't charge anything. So bringing me in doesn't cost you anything extra. The, the divorce specific real estate agent also, and I don't think in any case would charge you outside of just selling the house if they end up doing that. Right. So there's free services that you don't have to worry so much about paying extra for bringing in other members. It's really just designed to help you and kind of streamline the process and get experts involved. Yeah. And no additional cost. It's not like bringing in a divorce specific realtor or a divorce specific mortgage banker like myself you're not paying extra for that over somebody that doesn't have that experience. So you might as well have somebody that specializes in it that has the experience and expertise to get you through that process as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I find that a lot of times what happens is a lot of professionals, like I was just working with a client and she has her own attorney and I let her know I can interact with your attorney, but it's up to you and didn't need me to until a set point. And I jump on with the attorney and the attorney was like, I didn't know that there's somebody that could do this. I hate doing this part. And it's like, right. that's the whole goal is like separate out the parts that you know. Like I would never pretend to know 
how or if someone can qualify for a home, like you can provide that service. So whenever I talk to people, I'm like, if you have a home, you talk to someone like someone in Adam's role, because it's so important and it's free. So why not get that valuable information and then bring it to the table? I can help the clients use the information, but ultimately why not stay out of the realm of the things that you're good at? And so talking to this attorney, I'm like, yeah, of course you don't like looking through statements and figuring out the proposals for the split of the assets and debts and accounting for taxes and doing any of those things. That's not what you went to school for. It's not what you love to do. I mean, law students right. and attorneys like to joke, we don't like numbers, which is silly because it's what you do for a living is numbers. But why not shift that to someone that actually can specialize that area or take that on? Another common thing is mediators who don't specialize in finance and don't have that financial knowledge, just invite a CDFA into your meetings. So I teach at Arizona State's Law School, and we just did a 40-hour training for mediators. And a lot of them, you start teaching basics of finances and you see the fear and like the panic. <laughs> it's like, you're not responsible for knowing this. Someone else is, but you are responsible for saying, I don't know how to do this. And so I'm bringing this other person in. So I think it's just knowing like, where's your strengths, where your weaknesses are. There's always somebody in your area or even nationally that can help and be in that meeting to help assist in the things you don't know how to do rather than like really screwing somebody over with a bad agreement because you didn't have the information that you needed to make an educated agreement. Well, I think a lot of it is that the divorcing spouses are relying on these mediators and attorneys to be that you know, mm -hmm. expert. And if they're not getting that advice from them to go, all right, you need to get a financial person involved. You need to get a divorce specific mortgage person involved. They're not going to know to to have somebody in there. So a lot of it is just educating the divorcing spouses as well to know yep. you have these options. You don't have to just rely on your attorney. There's obviously more parts to the divorce team that you can bring in. You don't have to wait for the attorney to offer that up. So definitely the more we can get the word out to both divorcing spouses and the divorce attorneys and mediators, I think the better off everybody's going to be. So I agree. I mean, we touched on some of it, but what are the main benefits that you have in terms of the CDFA side versus just having like a typical financial advisor involved in the process of the divorce? So I want to say financial advisors play a very key role. So for example, a case I recently was referred to in one of the client's financial advisors they had really complex assets to divide and the financial advisor sat in on some of their meetings. And that gave us really the opportunity for the financial advisor to put their input in on what they would prefer in what area and all of those pieces from their perspective. The biggest difference to me for a CDFA is we're very focused on just the implications during divorce, which is why I just stay in the divorce realm. And so, for example, there's an entirely separate IRS tax code that applies when you go to divorce that doesn't apply any other time. So just being aware of those implications and making sure that someone else knows the specifics during a divorce. There's so many different ways to handle division of assets, retirement accounts. There's very tricky pieces that come into play, particularly when you get into things like military pensions or other forms of pensions, even state-based pensions. They're going to get super complex. And also just understanding the basics of finances as they're going through that. The biggest mistake that I see attorneys make is they don't account for taxability of assets. So what happens is they just throw everything in one pot and they're like, we'll just divide it. Well, you can't divide it because there's different tax implications that are associated with these things. So how I explain it to my clients is buckets. We put them in buckets and then we compare like things that live within the bucket so that they are compared logically. If we're going to trade an apple and an orange, we need to understand that they're separate. And how can we change one of those in terms of taxes to get as close as possible to an equalization of things? So just understanding not only the small kind of intricacies, but also the complexities that are associated with finances, that's really the goal of a CDFA. It's actually why I went back to get my CDFA was because I work with a lot of clients that are handling very complicated assets. And although I learned as I was going with my clients and by talking to CDFAs and reaching out, 
I saw the benefit of, I can be so much more helpful for my clients if I have this education and I better understand this. So we don't have to have as many people joining the room or this, this specific instance of mediation. That being said, still refer my clients out to other CDFAs for other purposes. And if they want to get their own individual advice from a CDFA, I can't do that when I'm working in mediation. I'm just a neutral. So it's really important to distinguish like what hat I'm wearing at each time and that I cannot give specific advice. So if they want that, great, then they can have another CDFA and I welcome them into my meetings so they can attend as well to help everybody really work through the differences and understand the complexities of their issues. Spoke to a couple of different things. Obviously, you're the mediation expert. We talked to litigation. There's collaborative divorce, cooperative or amicable, whatever you want to call it. Can you speak to some of the pros and the cons to each of those? We talked about the cost benefits, but um, yeah. are there other pros and cons that you'd like to speak to to each of those types of divorce options? Yeah. So, I mean, you have like the three main options. There's technically four, but like the three main options where you're working with people is litigation, collaborative mediation. Technically, there's a fourth option, which is do it yourself. As I tell people, I never recommend you do it yourself unless you have like a bank account and a car. And that's the only thing that you have. <laughs> Just because you're getting into the complexities again of tax codes and division of assets and working with figuring out your mortgage and all of those pieces in parenting time. Generally speaking, on a cost perspective, litigation is going to be highest, collaborative is going to be in the middle, mediation is going to be the lowest. Time perspective, mediation is typically going to be the shortest because it's based on your timeline. Litigation tends to be the longest because it's based on the court's timeline. I always describe it as like jury duty. You don't get to pick when you go to jury duty. The judge makes the decision for you. Same thing, you're working off the judge's calendar, not yours specifically. Collaborative is going to fall right in the middle. I think the biggest differences for me are, I truly believe that about 98% of cases can likely go through mediation. The biggest misconception is people think if they don't agree, they can't go through mediation, where I have extremely high conflict clients and they can still work through mediation. Litigation is going to particularly be focused to me on those cases where there's like fraud, domestic violence, cases where there needs to be an advocate and there needs to be very specific protection that is established by the court. Collaborative is this great option in the middle where essentially you're just getting more people on your team that are guaranteed on your team. So your team is pretty much selected generally for you. You get to pick the people that are in those roles, but the roles are already established. So each having an advocate, having a communication coach, maybe each having a financial neutral or a financial advocate and one financial neutral. So for those cases, I found that those are really helpful, particularly for those that are high conflict that don't think that they can mediate. But ultimately, I'm a big advocate of just mediate or do collaborative. Like there's very, 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 very few people <laughs> that need to be litigating and ultimately, you're saving so much money, you're saving so much time, you're making decisions for yourself. And statistically, people are going to follow decisions that they make for themselves much more frequently than they're going to follow a court's decision. So you might as well make those decisions for yourself rather than making someone else do it for you. See any real downside to the mediation? Because obviously it's cheaper and it takes less time. So what's the con on that? So mediation, I always say, is like the easiest business to have because we don't have a lot of cons. So it's not hard to talk to people about mediation. Mediation is problematic when there are situations where particularly domestic violence. So I'll have some cases where there is domestic violence present or interpersonal violence. The biggest issue is when one person fears for their safety based on the decisions that they're making. So I was established to my clients, we do domestic violence screenings during our intake and just always establish if they believe that there is domestic violence from their perspective in the relationship, do they feel comfortable and confident to share their perspective? If they don't, then mediation can be used in a negative way for the person that has more power to control the dynamic, shift the gain to themselves rather than equally to the spouse. So just making sure that it's a safe situation for clients to be in is the biggest thing for mediation. 
The other problem with mediation just generally is it's not a regulated field, which means someone can have a legal background or a CDFA background or a therapeutic background, or they could just be a guy in the corner who calls himself a mediator. So there's going to be a very large aspect of how much do you get charged? What does the process look like? What experience your mediator has? So biggest flaw of mediation is you need to make sure to interview your mediator and understand what kind of background they have to make sure that they can actually help you, not that they just generally have a training. There's just a 40 hour training with no testing to be a mediator. And then arguably you can mediate and no one's regulating that. So you arguably don't even have to have a 40 hour training. So it's just one of those things where like really be cautious about who is actually mediating your case. There are different sets of advice that you would give for somebody, you know, obviously if they're in Arizona, they can reach out to you, but in other states, what's the best course of action for somebody to find a good mediator in your opinion? Yeah. So particularly in the family realm, I'm a part of a national group called Academy of Professional Family Mediators, APFM. There's a directory on there. So you actually can use that directory if you want someone that specializes in family I highly recommend that because it's kind of like someone that says they dabble in every area of law. Yes, there's general practitioners, and it's not saying that it's bad to be a general practitioner. It's just saying family law is really, really complex. So you want to make sure that someone has expertise in that area that you're using. Then always do consultations. Kind of like using a new platform online. I always tell people, use the free 10-day trial. (laughs) Try it out first. So do a consultation and get information about that person's background. The big questions for me for mediators is always, what is your mediation style? So for example, do you typically work with people together, separately, with attorneys, without attorneys? What is your fee structure? Is it something that's going to be flat fee predictable? Is it going to be question mark? How long is the process going to take? And then primarily background. What is your background, education, experience? How long have you been focusing on family? Those are going to be really good questions for people to ask. But just making sure that you get that information before you get started so you're not halfway through and then realize that your mediator is not going to be the right fit for you. Any tips for people that want to go down the mediation route but don't want to get sabotaged into more of a litigating type of attorney that maybe get involved There is a mediator, but then it goes down that path where it is more combative and less um, amicable from what most mediations can be. Is there any advice for people that are going down that path that want to avoid that? So a good rule of thumb when interviewing an attorney, again, you're interviewing the attorney. Talk to more than one. See who's going to be a good fit for you. See how settlement minded they are. So are they interested in settling? Are they interested in convincing you that you're going to get everything? If they're saying stuff that just seems like pie in the sky, just really kind of connecting with like exactly what you want, but not seeming fair to your spouse, likely going to be more of an attorney who's going to be more like strong advocate litigation role. It's not saying that that's bad. It's just saying that that's going to be more their style rather than a settlement-minded attorney. Uh, Most mediators that you work with will have a list. So like my list of preferred advisors in Arizona, they're great advocates. They specialize in family law, but they're very settlement focused. You can also ask people, what's your percentage of time that you settle and what's your percentage of time that you go to court? Or how long does your process usually take? The longer the process, the more likely they'll go to court, they're more likely they're more litigious and adversarial than kind of your settlement-based attorney. So good point of reference would be talk to your mediator or other neutral who can guide you in who might be a settlement-minded attorney. And then two, interview your attorneys so that you know what that looks like. Well, this has been really helpful advice. I really appreciate you taking the time. If, If somebody does want to reach out to you on both the mediation side or the financial coaching side, what's the best way to learn more about your situation? So best way to learn more about me is Couples Solution Center in Arizona. I'm based out of Phoenix, Arizona. That's going to actually point you to everything that you need. So it's www.couplesolutioncenter.com. That's going to have blog posts. We have a YouTube page where we answer frequently asked questions. We're on social media answering questions. To us, it's really about educating people and making sure that they're on the right spot. We also offer a free divorce boot camp on Meetup. 
It is called Arizona Divorce Boot Camp, but the information is pretty general. And whenever we do it, I always say, just so you know, like this terminology is specific to Arizona, but all the concepts are the same. So that's a meetup group that meets twice a month and it's just over Zoom for an hour and a half. So that's another great way to just get initial information. And I can always point you in the direction from there as well to a mediator that I might know in your state or a resource that might be helpful for you there as well if Arizona isn't applicable to you. Yes. Well, perfect. Well, Kristen, I really appreciate you taking the time. Was there anything else you wanted to leave us with? No, I appreciate you having me and it was wonderful. I cannot speak highly enough again of the role that a divorce lending professional plays. Again, free service, super helpful. Tell all my clients to use it. So if you're going through the divorce process, please reach out to someone that can help you. I love Adam's little map. That's all the blue states because that always helps me remember what clients I can send his way. But just, it is such an imperative resource and it's just going to make you feel knowledgeable when you're reaching your agreements. So why not use it? And certainly even if they're in a different state, feel free to reach out to me. And I have a whole network of other CDLPs in other states that I can get you matched up with as well. Well, perfect. Well, it was great talking with you. Great talking with you too. Thank you.